being with us, and here's Robert. Okay, thank you very much, and uh, we want to welcome uh, Philip Fournes in our uh, and I want to uh, welcome all of those who are watching on um, Orho uh, the Way website uh, of the Cyril uh, Mount Orthodox uh, Church. Uh, there's many of them in India and, and around North America and Europe as well. Um, Philip Fornes earned a PhD in the history of uh, Christianity from Princeton Theological Seminary in 2016. Currently, he is at the uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main, where he leads a project on cultural exchange among Eastern Christian communities uh, through the translation of early Christian literature. His book, uh, Preaching Christology in the Roman Near East, takes up the question of whether Jacob Sarug was really as distant from the Christological controversies of his day as has normally been assumed. Um, Fornes uh, argues that the traditional understanding of Jacob as a purely conciliatory figure, separated from these debates, does not hold up. Jacob rather engaged in these debates and advocated for a non-Chalcedonian, Neophysite Christology, both through his, uh, through his letters uh, and through his homilies. Uh, Fornes is uh, forthcoming critical edition, translation, and study of Jacob of Sarug's homily on Thomas and New Sunday will appear from Peter's later this year. And he is also currently working on a monograph on the interpretation of Doubting Thomas in the first millennium. Uh, his paper today, uh, we've had it uh, announced, but uh, just so that we're on the same track, is a mediator between exegetical traditions Jacob of Sarug and his letters on. And with that, uh, welcome uh, Philip in, in your. Thanks so much, Bob, for the, the kind introduction. And thanks also to Rondo for organizing. In this, I'd like to greet um, Your Excellencies, Bishop Gregory and Bishop Zidon, as well as friends and colleagues from around the world. It's really a delight to be here with you today. Let me share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation to accompany the talk. Great. Last month, Sebastian Brock gave us many reasons to celebrate the work of Jacob of Sarug, his wide ranging and diverse corpus of homilies, hymns, and letters, his playful and creative manner of biblical exegesis, his attention to the voices of women in the biblical narrative the ecumenical reception of his works, and of course, the pure joy of reading his poetry and literary prose. In the subsequent lectures, we'll delve into more specific aspects of Jacob's thought and legacy to open hopefully new perspectives on the Bishop of Sarug. Today, I'd like to draw our attention to just two aspects. First, Jacob's letters as a source for exegetical thought, and second, Jacob's function as a mediator between the Greek and Syriac exegetical traditions. Let me say just a few words on Jacob as an intermediary between the Greek and Syriac traditions. Jacob received an education in the city of Edessa in the second half of the fifth century. At this time, as he himself states, the works of major Greek exegetes like Diodore of Tarsus, Theodore of Mopsuestia, and others were being translated into Syriac in Edessa. Indeed, the influence of these figures on Jacob's thought is patent, and we can tie his understanding of certain passages directly to his familiarity with these authors. This is one direction of the relationship between Greek and Syriac traditions in Jacob's thought. A second aspect relates to the reception of Jacob's works over time. The hymns are more specifically the Kentakia of Romanos the Melodist, a younger contemporary of Jacob of Sarug and a Greek author, feature motifs and exegetical content that reflect Ephraim the Syrian's works. As recent studies have shown, it is in fact Jacob's homilies that served as a bridge in bringing these exegetical traditions into the Greek world. <laughs> 
Thus, there is evidence that sometime after his death, Jacob's works mediated motifs from the Syriac exegetical tradition to Romanos. My presentation today focuses on the third aspect of Jacob's role as a mediator between these traditions. I will argue that Jacob served as a mediator between the Greek and Syriac tradition within his own lifetime through one of his letters, which he addressed to a Greek-speaking ecclesiastical leader. My talk will proceed in four sections. First, we will consider Jacob's letters, which have received comparatively little attention, despite their value for understanding Jacob's thought. Second, we will turn to one of Jacob's letters that he wrote to a Greek-speaking lector, or reader, and examine the historical processes that enabled communication between Greek and Syriac in his day. In the third and fourth sections, we'll see how Jacob draws on both Greek and Syriac exegetical traditions in his discussion of biblical exegesis in this letter. This will help us arrive at a round picture of Jacob's role as a mediator between these traditions, both in regard to the historical realities and the contours of his thought. Let me say a few words about Jacob's letters in general. 42 letters by Jacob and one written to him survive to the present. The majority of these letters are only extant in two manuscripts that date to the seventh century. You can see one here on the previous slide, and we'll see the other later. These manuscripts came to London only in the 19th century. A few of these letters, written to a monastery outside of Antioch, played a decisive role in changing views about Jacob's understanding of Christology in the 19th century. But on the whole, the letters have received comparatively little attention. Translations of most of the corpus are available in Arabic, French, German, and Italian, and most of these have appeared in the last 30 years. The letters cover a variety of themes, including asceticism, monastic practice, letters of consolation, ecclesiastical vocations, theological debates, and of course, biblical exegesis. They demonstrate as a whole Jacob's connection to an ecclesiastical network, but also show him engaging with civil and military officials in the Roman Near East where he resided. A few letters even show him corresponding with communities well outside his local context, in Persia, on Mount Sinai, and in South Arabia. One highlight of Jacob's letters is the vibrancy they bring to the ideas he expresses in his homilies. Jacob discusses monastic life explicitly in a couple of his homilies, and he surely held many of his homilies before a monastic audience. But in his letters, we see him advising a particular monk on whether to take, or person on whether to take a monastic vow, and counseling women who had been in prostitution, but now had become monastics. Other letters show us how Jacob applies his Christological teachings in situations of distress to comfort a community that had endured persecution, and in writing words of consolation to a father who had lost his son. The letters reveal in this way the context in which Jacob's thought developed and put a very human face on an orator whose world is often hard to discern from his homilies. Several letters in Jacob's corpus focus on questions of biblical interpretation usually in response to individuals who wrote to him. One of these letters, which is now letter 23, forms the largest letter in Jacob's epistolary corpus, covering some 35 pages in the Syriac edition. In this letter, Jacob responds to six exegetical questions that his correspondent Maron had posed. The six questions all revolve around difficulties in the biblical text. On the fact that God rested on the seventh day is the first question. The second question is about on the calculation of Noah's age at the time of the flood. The third on the calculation of the time that Abraham's seed would be subjugated in Egypt. The fourth on the bread of the presence that the priest Ahimelech gave to David when this was against Mosaic law. And fifth, on the fact that God is said to have regretted making Adam as well as for crowning Saul king. And finally, on the reconciliation of the genealogies in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The questions cover a set of related themes. The questions about God resting and God regretting relate to anthropomorphic statements about God in the Bible. 
the questions about Noah's age in the time Abraham's seed would be subjugated, as well as the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, all relate to seeming inconsistencies in the biblical text. The fourth question might also relate to this theme of inconsistencies, as Jesus uses David as an example of working on the Sabbath, since David broke Mosaic law by eating the bread of priests. Despite the relationship between these topics, Jacob chooses to address them in order, only grouping his responses to the second and third question together. But discussions of topics like the Sabbath recur throughout the work, throughout this letter, and could have been combined too. It seems that Jacob had received this list of six questions directly from Maron and answered them just as he received them. He chose not to respond with a theological tractate that synthetically treated all of these themes together. Jacob's decision to respond to Maron's questions individually invites us to explore the correspondence between these two figures at a deeper level and to think what it means that Jacob answered these questions in a letter and not in another genre. In the second section of this presentation, we'll turn to the historical circumstances of the letter. This is essential to my central argument that Jacob served as a mediator between the Greek and Syriac exegetical traditions. Here we will see how this communication unfolded. That is, how Jacob writing in Syriac corresponded with an ecclesiastical leader who wrote in Greek. The title to this letter clarifies that the addressee was named Maron. As has already been suggested some time ago, this is very likely the same Maron who corresponded with Jacob's contemporaries, Severus of Antioch and Philoxenus of Bumbug. The Maron with whom Severus and Philoxenus communicated held the ecclesiastical rank of lector or reader in the church of Anazarbus. Anazarbus, as you can see from the map, was not so far geographically from Antioch, but was at some distance, both physically and, and as well related to linguistic traditions, from Mabug and Batnai of Sarug. The city of Anazarbus had become quite important by the early 6th century. It was the capital city of the Roman province of Cilicia Secunda, and there were a couple churches erected in and around the city exactly at this time in the second decade of the 6th century. The Bishop of Anazarbus was an ally of Severus of Antioch in the Christological disputes that broke out at this time. Baron's correspondence with Severus of Antioch shows his interest in questions about Christology as well as biblical exegesis. This interest in Christology he shared with his bishop, and it served as a good reason for Maron to write to Severus, who, at least according to the ecclesiastical structure, was set above the bishop of Anazarbus. Maron's correspondence with Philoxenus proves especially important for our consideration of Jacob's letter. Philoxenus wrote his letter to Maron around the year 515 and provides precious details about the path of their correspondence. Maron sent two letters to Philoxenus before he received a reply. The first letter was brought to Philoxenus by a messenger from Antioch, but the messenger didn't have any idea who Maron was. He was simply the messenger. Since Philoxenus also didn't know who Maron was, he didn't reply to the first letter. The second letter arrived from a messenger appointed by Maron. This messenger told Philoxenus who Maron was and informed him about his concerns. As we learn from the letter, Maron and his bishop had supported Severus of Antioch in his non-Chalcedonian Neophysite Christology. But a group of pro-Chalcedonian leaders had gathered not too far from Anazarbus, about halfway between Antioch and Anazarbus in the year 515, and posed some challenging questions to the non-Chalcedonians like Maron. In this context, Maron wrote to Philoxenus, seeking his response to seven questions regarding the theological challenges he was facing. Philoxenus importantly notes that his response was delayed because the process of translating his letter from Syriac to Greek took some time. With Philoxenus' letter, we have a concrete example of how a Syriac bishop could correspond with a Greek-speaking lector. Philoxenus had, of course, sponsored a translation of the New Testament from Greek to Syriac just a few years prior. And while it might seem surprising that he could not or chose not to compose a letter in Greek, this process of translating letters was evidently quite common. 
Philoxenista's letter provides a backdrop for the very similar details we find in Jacob of Sarug's letter to Maron. At the beginning of the letter, Jacob tells Maron, and I quote, your letter has been read before me. And then he specifies that this letter was written to others so that they might bring me the request. The phrase written to others proves a bit difficult to interpret. It may be that Maron did not originally address the letter to Jacob, but it reached him through others. Jacob's letter also draws attention to the processes of translation that enabled him and Maron to communicate with each other. While praising Maron for asking such insightful questions about biblical exegesis, Jacob notes that the loftiness of the questions was diminished when unspecified people, as Jacob writes, were translating it from one language to another. Jacob returns to the discussion of translation later in the letter, when he finds it necessary to discuss differences between the Greek and Syriac versions of a passage from 1 Samuel. He states, For the Syriac states the words of David in this way, even if the Greek states them differently, as you know. But the sense of their interp interpretation leads the versions in both languages to the single or to one meaning. Jacob of Sarug's letter to Maron forms the only secure example of his correspondence with a figure who wrote in Greek. Jacob himself comments on the translation of the letter and the path by which it reached him, and his remarks reflect what is known about Maron's correspondence with both Severus of Antioch and Philoxenus of Mabug. Here we've explored what processes of translation enabled their communication. In the remainder of the talk, we'll turn to the content that Jacob chose to communicate to his Greek-speaking correspondent. In the third section of this presentation, I'd like to turn to one aspect of Jacob's mediation between exegetical traditions. As I noted at the very beginning, Jacob himself mentions translations of Greek exegetical works available to him as a student in Edessa, and his works themselves exhibit knowledge of these traditions. His response to one of Maron's questions likewise displays his knowledge of a particular aspect of Greek exegetical thought. Here, though, he chooses to communicate this tradition to his Greek-speaking correspondent. Even a casual reader of the Gospels of Matthew and Luke notices the great differences in the presentation of Jesus' ancestry. Maron stood in good company when he posed his sixth question to Jacob which reads as follows. Concerning the account of the generations of the nativity of Christ, where the blessed Matthew begins with Abraham and goes up to Joseph, but the blessed Luke be begins by going from Joseph up to Adam. The names recounted by the two authors are not the same, even though they drank of one spirit, but in various places, their order differs from one another in the succession of the generations. In his response to this question, Jacob largely draws on a Greek work dating to the third century, but also reflects more recent developments attested in a contemporaneous Syriac source. Maron's question reflects his uneasiness with the different names found in the genealogies of Jesus, as well as the ordering of the names. Jacob takes two major approaches to addressing these potential conflicts. First, he points to the audiences of the Gospels. Matthew wrote to the Hebrews, Mark to the Romans, Luke wrote to the Gentiles. Thus, it makes sense that Matthew would focus on Abraham, while Luke would trace the history all the way back to Adam to include all of humanity. Second, Jacob points to the theological significance of the genealogies that affirm the incarnation against those who would deny it. Here he names a typical cast of those regarded as heretics, Marcion, Manny, and Bardison, and he offers a quotation from each of them. Jacob's response thus attends to the historical circumstances in which the evangelist supposedly wrote, as well as to the theological teachings that underline these works. When we look further at the details in Jacob's response, we'll see that he offers a conventional response to Maron that can be tied directly to a Greek exegetical tradition. In identifying the different audiences for Matthew's and Luke's Gospels, Jacob states that Matthew presents Jesus's genealogy in terms of nature, while Luke does so from a legal standpoint. <laughs> 
This helps explain the differences in the individuals named as Joseph's father, Jacob and Matthew, Healy and Luke. Jacob resolved the differences in Joseph's immediate ancestors as follows. He writes, Haley and Jacob were children of one woman, and Jacob was known as the father to Joseph by nature, but Haley by the law. The letter to Maron does not expand upon this rather short clarification, but comparison with other late antique sources can help fill in the details. Jacob draws on here in an explanation first found in the Greek letter to Aristides of Julius Africanus from the early third century. Africanus's letter addresses the difference in the genealogies in reference to the law and nature. It states that the individuals named as Joseph's fathers were brothers. That is, Jacob and Haley were brothers. Jacob was Joseph's natural father, and when Jacob died, Haley, according to the custom, married his widow and became Jacob's legal father. The letter to Aristides even takes us a step further and explains the differences in Joseph's grandfathers in exactly the same way. Thus, while Jacob is Joseph's father according to nature, Haley is his father according to the law. Jacob may have had access to this originally Greek exegetical tradition through several paths. In his extended study of the letter to Aristides, Christophe Guignard suggests that the differences between Jacob's letter to Maron and the letter to Aristides suggests that Jacob only had indirect knowledge of this letter to Aristides. Syriac translations of two works by Eusebius of Caesarea that include excerpts from the letter to Aristides or recount its arguments appeared before Jacob's day. The ecclesiastical history of Eusebius as well as his gospel problems and solutions. But neither of these sources can fully account for Jacob's knowledge of the arguments in the letter to Aristides as suggested by Guignard. Be building on Guignard's work, I'd like to suggest that there's a common development of the letter to Aristides among Syriac authors that's attested on the one hand by Jacob of Sarug and the other hand by Philoxenus of Mabuk. Philoxenus wrote commentaries on Matthew and Luke in the early 6th century that survive today only in fragmentary form. An analysis of these fragments suggests that he had access, so Guignard, to an otherwise unknown Syriac translation of Eusebius's gospel problems and solutions, where he would have encountered this standard natural and legal resolution to the differences in the genealogies. But Jacob's and Philoxenus's resolutions to the problems of the genealogies share common reflection on two biblical passages that are not found in the letter to Aristides, nor in Eusebius's transmission of this solution. Their engagement with these passages, which have little to do with the genealogies themselves, suggests to me that they belong to a, Syria, a common Syriac tradition of resolving this problem, which was built upon the tradition of found in the letter to Aristides. We'll examine these two passages now. Jacob and Philoxenus both cite Romans 8 when discussing Luke's genealogy that stretches all the way back to Adam. Jacob weaves in Romans as follows. Luke rightly offered a reminder that Adam is the father of those who were named the ancestors of Christ, and he was in the image of God in the likeness of the representation of his son. As it is written, he knew them before and appointed them to be in the likeness of the representation of his son. It is also written, those whom he appointed beforehand he called, and those whom he called he made righteous. Jacob explains this passage as follows. Christ took on the likeness of Adam through his birth from Mary, and he restored to humanity that righteousness which humanity had lost by following the advice of the serpent. In his explanation that leads to this uh, explanation of the reconciliation of humanity in reference to this passage, Jacob also importantly incorporates the Pauline concept of adoption, which is found in Romans 8.15 as well as in Galatians. Philoxenus similarly invokes Romans 8 when exploring Luke's genealogy, quoting, like Jacob, Romans 8.29, and also, like Jacob, referring to the concept of adoption found in Romans 8.15. Philoxenus's full explanation of this passage survives only in fragmentary form, 
But it is clear that he uses Romans to explain forgiveness from sin, pointing here to Cain's murder of Abel. There are some differences in the way that Jacob and Philoxenus use Romans 8. Yet it is significant that both authors draw in Romans 8.29 and the Pauline language of adoption to discuss the redemption of humanity through the transmission of the image of God. Romans 8 has, after all, no formal links to the genealogy in Luke. Both authors also point to another biblical passage related to the language of the likeness or the image of God, namely Genesis 1.26, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Jacob first alludes to this passage in his discussion of Romans 8, suggesting that God had given humanity righteousness by creating it in his image and in his likeness. He then returns to this language to rebuke those who would deny the incarnation of the only begotten Son of God, which Luke himself explains by making his genealogy ascend all the way back to Adam and ultimately to God. Philoxenus discusses Genesis 1.26 in the same fragment of his commentary in which he comments on Romans 8. He interprets Genesis 1.26 to mean that the image of God, whom Romans 8.29 identifies as the Son of God, has been transmitted through all generations. This transmission proceeds all the way down through all generations to the Son of God, who in his baptism establishes, and I quote Philoxenus, a new womb that gives birth to the children of God. Here Jacob and Philoxenus certainly lay different emphases on this passage. But Luke's genealogy, again, does not naturally lead to a discussion of creation, much less of Genesis 1.26, aside from the reference to Adam. The constellation of biblical citations in Jacob's and Philoxenus' treatment of Luke's genealogy stands out. It is possible that Jacob knew Philoxenus' commentary and drew some inspiration from it in his response to Maron, if Jacob's responding in the second decade of the 6th century. The commentary itself dates to around 505, and the fragment under discussion survives in a manuscript to dating to 510 or 511. A second possibility is that Jacob and Philoxenus are familiar with an otherwise unknown exegetical tradition that links these passages. Neither Romans 8 nor Genesis 1.26 feature in the letter to Aristides or Eusebius's Gospel Problems and Solutions, so there may be an intermediate source that transmitted the traditions about the genealogies alongside reflections on these passages. In summary, the letter to Maron demonstrates that Jacob drew on an originally Greek exegetical tradition to answer Maron's question about the inconsistencies in the genealogies. This Greek tradition had circulated already for some time by Jacob's day. The similarities between Jacob's and Philoxenus's explanations may suggest a common elaboration of this explanation by Syriac exegetes. Here Jacob served as a mediator of a Greek exegetical explanation and seems to have communicated what might have been a particular Syriac gloss on this tradition. Now that we've seen how Jacob communicates a Greek exegetical tradition to Maron, we'll now consider how Jacob mediates Syriac traditions to his Greek correspondent. Here I will focus on the correlation between Jacob's own homilies and his responses to two of Maron's questions. Both Maron's first and his fifth questions relate to anthropomorphic statements about God resting and God regretting. Jacob's treatment of these passages in two of his homilies contain significant parallels to those in his letter to Maron. While Jacob's homilies did not apparently undergo translation into Greek, this letter served as a means of spreading Jacob's exegesis to a Greek-speaking audience. The first question Maron posed to Jacob reads as follows. In the book of Genesis, it says that the universe was established in six days, and God called the seventh day rest. But we see that God carry out activities even on this day. Jacob responds in two primary ways to Maron's questions. 
Each of these, as I will argue, shares connections to Jacob's homilies on the creation of the world, which is also known as Jacob's hexaemeron. In his exposition of God's resting, in the homily on the creation of the world, Jacob addresses the question of whether God acted on the seventh day. He writes, look, he did not stay silent for managing the universe he had created, making the sun rise, making the moon run its course, bringing forth lightning strikes, causing thunder to be heard, bringing down rain, making seeds sprout, making the winds blow, gathering fruit in trees, fashioning grapes in their clusters on the vines, making rivers gush out and come forth from a spring forming infants within the married women in their wombs and doing every day those things that were done. As it is said, my father has been at work until now. Jacob's argument runs here that the regular activities of nature did not cease on the seventh day, and thus one should not understand God's resting, resting on this day to indicate that God needed rest after becoming weary from the work of creation on the first six days. There's a very similar argument in the letter to Maron. A slightly shortened quotation of this extended passage reads as follows. The one who arranged the luminaries in the firmament on the fourth day is the one who leads, and brings for, leads forth and brings them out on the seventh day. The one who commands the earth to bring forth vegetation and the sea to swarm with fish and birds on the fifth day would not cease on the seventh day from having the seed grown grow and propagating the fish and birds. The one who formed Adam out of the dust on the sixth day would not cease on the seventh day from fashioning likenesses from marriage in the wombs of married women. For this reason, the son who is like the father in everything also formed mud on the day of the Sabbath and opened the eyes of the blind man. When he was rebuked by the hypocrites, he scorned and silenced them, saying, My father has been at work until now, and I also have been at work. Here we see Jacob run through the activities for the fourth through six days. Parallels with the homily include the celestial lights, vegetation on the earth, and especially the formation of children and the wombs of married women, where similarities in the Syriac vocabulary can be observed. But the fact that a citation of John 5.17 directly follows the list of activities helps demonstrate the parallel lines of arguments in these works. A second interpretation of this passage on God's resting in the homily on the creation of, world, of the world suggests that God's resting applies to God the Son, not God the Father. In the passage on the slide, Jacob explains his own views as opposing someone who would attribute rest to God the Father. Jacob writes, the scripture proclaims that the Lord rested, but he does not understand. When there is no body, there is no weariness or fatigue. The son who was embodied grew weary on the cross because of the ruler of the air. And from that weariness, he entered rest on the seventh day. For it is never said about the father that he grew weary, nor that he rested, aside from parables and allegories. In the homily on the creation of the world, Jacob emphasizes that the son of God rested after the crucifixion since he had a body. The resting mentioned in Genesis 2-2 cannot apply on Jacob's view physically to God the Father, who has no body. The discussion of how God's resting should apply to God the Son rather than God the Father in the letter to Maron is much more extensive than in the homily. Yet Jacob's opening words echo those found in the homily. He writes, but since the scripture cannot be abolished, no one can speak against it, and it is written that God rested on the day of the Sabbath. Let us seek, and it will be found. Christ, who is God, grew weary on the cross on the sixth day and rested from the sufferings of the crucifixion on the day of the Sabbath. He grew weary on Golgotha and rested within the grave. He grew weary because he was embodied. He grew weary because he came in the flesh. The Son of God grew weary because he became a human being by taking on a body through the Virgin. Jacob clarifies that God's resting can physically apply to Christ because he had taken on a body, an argument clearly expressed in the homily as well as in the letter to Maron. Here too, Maron gained access to Jacob's exegesis 
found in his homily on the creation of the world, but here through a letter. Let us now look at Jacob's response to Maron's fifth question to find a connection between this letter and another of Jacob's homilies. Maron's fifth question revolves around anthropomorphic statements regarding God and the Bible, and especially Genesis 6-6. Maron wrote, in what sense does the scripture say the Lord repented or regretted making Adam on the earth, and that God said, I re regretted making Saul king? For behold, these words point to human passion. While a wide variety of authors discuss this passage, the particular way that Jacob addresses this question forms a clear connection to his homiletical corpus. At the beginning of his response to Maron regarding this passage, Jacob lays emphasis on the didactic function of the statement about God's regret in Genesis 6.6. Since he wanted to awaken regret among humanity, and it was right for them to regret the wickedness that they had done. For this reason, he said that he regretted so that they might follow him and return to repentance with compunction. He spoke a transgressive word to show that sin had overflowed beyond measure. The iniquity was just as great as the word was outsized. The inappropriateness of speaking of God's regret corresponds to the extent of humanity's wickedness. But by using such a word, God could lead humanity to pursue acts of repentance for its sin. I've not found the didactic function of this passage, that is what humankind should learn from it, expressed so clearly in other writings, although there is one occasion in Ephraim's corpus that comes quite close. A parallel interpretation of this passage can be found in Jacob's homily on the flood. In his explanation of Genesis 6, 6 in this homily, Jacob states, For even though he did not regret, he regretted so that he might make them regret. But the heart of stone would not express remorse or be softened. He set grief upon his divine being instead of upon the sinners. But they did not want to grieve for the iniquity they had done. He was clothed with a face of compunction so that they might be like him, but they had no pity on themselves through repentance. Just as the letter, this homily makes clear that speaking of God's regret was a means of encouraging humanity to regret its own iniquity. Here too, we find that the letter to Maron and one of Jacob's homilies share an exegetical explanation. This brief comparison of these works has demonstrated parallel lines of argument in the letter to Maron and two of Jacob's homilies. While this conclusion may prove unsurprising, it nevertheless demonstrates the potential value inherent to putting these works side by side, as some themes are explored more extensively in the letters than the homilies and vice versa. More importantly for this presentation, these shared explanations also demonstrate that Jacob's letters functioned as a vehicle for communicating the exegetical teachings found in his homilies to the Greek-speaking world, or at least to this Greek-speaking correspondent. While we cannot trace in what form Maron received this letter, or if he ever responded to it, Jacob's response to Maron demonstrates how even in his lifetime, he sought to serve as a mediator between the Greek and Syriac exegetical traditions. Let me offer a few thoughts by way of conclusion. This lecture series has been organized to celebrate Jacob of Sarug, whose works have been read and transmitted now for over 1500 years. Jacob made a major contribution to the Syriac tradition. He stood firmly within this tradition as an exegete of, and indeed, a, even a commentator on Ephraim's works, and his works bear many similarities to those of his contemporaries, Narsai, Philoxenus, Isaac, and so forth. His homilies have rightly been studied as a preeminent example of the Syriac exegetical and theological tradition. But Jacob's letters, which have received less attention on the whole, open some new perspectives. First, the letters form a natural bridge to historical studies of late antiquity. Jacob's epistolary corpus is one of the most extensive collections of letters preserved in Syriac up to the 6th century. In this presentation, we've seen the fascinating and indeed rare information that enabled bilingual correspondence. 
The study of Jacob's letters has much to gain from comparisons with other epistolary corpora, and it has indeed much that it can contribute to such historical investigations. Second, this focus study of the letter to Maron has also shown the importance of interpreting Jacob's homilies alongside his letters. Exegetical explanations of passages found in his letters sometimes find fuller explanations in his homilies. Further, his letters often show which context prompted him to reflect on individual passages and thus put a human perspective on his sometimes abstract thought. Finally, there's often a better chance of dating his letters than his homilies so that we can begin to speak of when Jacob offered particular exegetical explanations. Third, while the letter to Maron forms the only letter in which Jacob directly discusses the process of translation, it's likely that he corresponded with other speakers from the Greek-speaking world. We may be only able to glimpse the tip of an iceberg here. But even the single letter shows that Jacob both engaged with Greek exegetical traditions and communicated his own exegetical solutions from the Syriac tradition in his correspondence with a Greek-speaking author. While previous studies have shown Jacob's connections to the Greek-speaking world through his education and the reception of his ideas, I've argued here that Jacob served as a mediator between the Greek and Syriac exegetical traditions, even in his lifetime, on the basis of this letter. This presentation forms one small contribution to the study of Jacob's broader significance in his own time. There is, of course, much to gain from continuing to investigate Jacob from within the Syriac tradition, and the study of his thought is hardly conceivable without reference to this tradition. But his corpus also deserves our attention as a literary product of the multilingual and intercultural currents that characterize late antiquity. Only by considering Jacob within a wider framework will the study of this preeminent Syriac thinker find a place in the broader historical narrative of late antique Christianity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philip, for this wonderful talk. It's wonderful to have you and to listen to your talk. Now the floor is open for questions. As I said earlier, if you'd like to ask questions, all you have to do is click on the reaction uh, icon underneath the video feed, uh, raise your hand and uh, I will give you access to uh, uh, asking questions. Jeff. Thank you. Um, thanks, Phil, for uh, the wonderful talk. Uh, just a comment and the question. The comment, um, it just seems like such a um, clear continuation of the work you're doing in your book of taking this corpus of Jacob, which seems so resistant to being um, connected to a concrete world and events and time and place and doing that so articulately. So it's cool to see that the question um, you traced out these interesting parallels between the, the letters and the homilies. Um, and you mentioned at the end that that can help with things like dating, but I wonder if you could speak uh, just a little bit more about what you see as the kind of consequences of, of uh, seeing these, these parallels, that it's in a sense the same Jacob in the letter and the homily, the same kind of mind at work, but operating in these different venues. Could you just speak a little bit more about um, uh, kind of the ramifications of that observation. Yeah, thanks so much, Jeff. And it's also uh, really nice to see you um, here in this context. Um, yeah, a few words about that. So as far as dating, we do have a few letters that we can date with, um, with some certainty, especially with Maron, who's a historical figure that we know from other contexts. For me, that's very important because we see Jacob developing the same thoughts between the letters and the homilies in a very specific and concrete situation. In this situation, it happens to be exegetical questions that were posed to him. But in other contexts, we see him applying his exegesis to pastoral situations. So perhaps there we gain an insight into the reasons why he is explaining the Bible in this particular way, 
um, if there's a particular pastoral situation that would call for this or political situation even it could be. So that's one much in Maran. Um, the other aspect of that is for me, and I think this was evident in one of the quotations where we had the list of the various works of um, creation that did not stop on the seventh day or the God's acting on the seventh day, bringing out the celestial luminaries, bringing vegetation forth on the earth and these things. And then we get to a passage um, from John uh, 5, 17. Um, Look, even now my father is at work. We have a longer explanation of that in the letter where Jacob talks about Jesus healing uh, the blind man by making mud a very nice uh, creation reference there. I think the word must have been Tina that was used there too, um, to heal the blind man, which is actually from John 9. Um, so there are different passages, but these are the things Jesus did on the Sabbath. These are the things he said on the Sabbath. So he links these together. And so in that way, we're seeing a gap. I, th I think we're seeing a, or a bridge between he's actually saying in the homily, but that's not evident at least in the text that transmitted to us. Um, so to see these further links in his thought, it depends which passage we're talking about, whether the homily, well, they tend to be quite long. Sometimes we have a lot more there, but in the letters, um, perhaps he goes on about a particular passage or a word like God's rest for longer than he does in the homily itself. So those are the implications I see for this that we gain new insight um, by comparing these works, since we rarely have homilies by Jacob that are on the same topic told from the same perspective, especially in regard to the Bible. We have that um, with Sydney in the sidelines, some homilies on the end, homilies on um, burying people. Um, but as far as the exegetical homilies, usually they aren't on the same topic. Thank you, Jeff. Michael? Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was very enlightening. I had a question pertaining to, um, you mentioned how St. Jacob was seen as a particularly conciliatory figure, especially in Christology. I was wondering if you could uh, elucidate where this sort of narrative comes from um, and then what the consequences of deconstructing it would be, especially in, for instance, exegesis, reading these letters that you had examined Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Michael. Um, the idea that Jacob is a conciliatory, um, conciliatory figure um, doesn't come from nowhere. Um, and that is that in a, in a way, um, Jacob is a conciliatory figure um, in that he's a figure who expresses his Christology and his particular views on Christology in a way that could be interpreted um, by different people. Um, in, um, in various ways, or it could be interpreted in a way that they were pleased with. In my book, which has um, somewhat to do with the lecture today, is that Jacob's um, adherence or his, um, his own ideas about Neophysite Christology are actually evident in a lot more of his works than has been traditionally um, assumed. He works on exegesis, uh, a work that we're teaching doctrine to people, so um, um, perhaps in a uh, catechetical context, that we see Jacob's Christology playing a very large role um, within these um, It would be hard to decipher for the average person um, standing in the church at that point. But I think that at another level, these homilies could have been un understood by fellow Neophysites, fellow non-Chalcedonians within his lifetime, his language, as affirming their position. Um, the other aspect of um, Jacob as a conciliatory figure is that he's been received as a saint um, in a number of traditions, um, both by Chalcedonians and non-Chalcedonians. So there is um, a wrestling with that that is very fruitful for ecumenical thought today um, to see how Jacob has been received um, um, as an authoritative figure within two, um, two traditions that often are assumed, um, often it's seen as opposing each other. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Susan? 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil, for this wonderful paper and the richness of the material that you brought so clearly this morning. Um, my question is not te technically, Jacob, one of the things that your talk made very clear is Jacob's scholarly training which clearly had a lot of depth to it. And so it's very impressive when a scholar and an intellectual with that kind of uh, learned in, uh, knowledge can convey it in, at such an accessible level as Jacob does in his homilies. And of course, you deal with this beautifully in your book. But I'm struck by the pragmatic challenge of translators that you refer to. And at two levels. I mean, it seems to me that the translators who were translating, for example, Greek exegetical scholarship, the uh, translating the works of Diodor, Theodore, such translators needed themselves to be quite learned in order to understand what they were translating from and to. The letters, the letters themselves, where you, you gave us this one reference to the need for a translator and maybe didn't express very well the level of, of um, there's a kind of social here for these translate messengers carrying these letters back and forth, but they needed also a very high level of education, am I correct, in order to be able to transmit these learned questions and Mm. As through the medium of a letter, do you have any other just talk at all about like where do these messengers come from? <laughs> translate obtuse Christology effectively between bishops. Yeah, thanks so much, Susan. It's, it's great to see you. And um, this is um, this is a question I, I was really struck by. One of the reasons I was drawn to working on this letter. Um, we should make a distinction here um, in terms of translation too. I think there's a few different situations here. So um, I'll speak first about Philosophus's letter. So what it seems like the context is, is that um, with Philosophus, when he sends his letters back, there's a delay or he, he makes this as his excuse for sending a delayed um, uh, letter back to Maron because it had to be translated. So that means to me, and I think it's implied that his letter, what he wrote it in Syriac, and that's what we have, it was preserved in his Episcopal archive, perhaps, whatever that might have looked like, and perhaps he was also able to control the translation. So it was undertaken by someone else to write it in Greek, perhaps by a native speaker, and then Philoxenus perhaps was able to check it because the translation happened after um, Philoxenus, or um, it happened before the letter left um, Philoxenus. In Jacob's case, it's not clear to me when he talks about being translated from one letter to, or from one language to another language, whether this actually means a physical translation or a, um, a written translation, or whether this is something that is being done orally. My hunch is, um, and this has, it, um, this has to do with the similarity in the letters that both Philoxenus and Jacob wrote to Maron, is that someone read out the letter, did a, a rough oral um, translation of it um, just um, simultaneously, and then they made a list of the six questions in Jacob's case, or in Philoxenus's case, it's seven questions, um, that were then translated into Syria. The reason I think this is that in both at least in Jacob's letter, I should look more into this with Philoxenus, the, the form of the questions in the introduction to Jacob's letters, he said, here are the six questions you asked me, he lists them, this is page two or something of the, of the letter. They're exactly the same as what you find later in the letter. So he's working from a written text um, in these cases. Um, but I think the initial translation from Greek to Syriac must have been, or it seems that it was oral in this case. Um, we have another example. Um, Sebastian Brock has published this letter that was written from the monastery of Marbasus to Severus of Antioch. Um, this came out, I think, in 2016 or so, um, where um, a letter being sent back to Severus was then read before the monastery so that um, the, I believe it was so that everyone could sign on to it in the monastery so that they could understand 
understand them, understand it. So I think what we have there is a Greek letter that's then being simultaneously translated into Syriac so that people can sign on to the... So we do have various processes of translation going on here. Um, one further detail, um, trying to remember this correctly, um, with the works of when, Sever when Sergius of Rishina translated um, from Greek into Syriac, so not too, too much later than this period, um, he would translate it first orally, and then someone else would translate it into a more beautiful Syriac. So, so they worked together in pairs when they were engaged in this sort of translation. Um, I haven't investigated that enough to know how common that is, but my, my hunch is that this is a well-attested practice of translation. So that speaks to a great deal of learning, um, but also to teamwork to make it um, reach its final form. Um, so I think it's really interesting to think about education, as you mentioned, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, for your question. And there's a question from Stephen Ring, he wrote, thank you for your interesting talk. There's a link between Jacob and Roman. And to what extent link has been established? Thank you, Stephen, for your question. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, I first became aware of this through, through Mandoli Papoutsaki's writing. Um, so he has an article from Ephraim to Romanos where he makes a specific case about um, a literary a motif that is found in Ephraim and Romanos, but is transformed um, a bit in Jacob and then becomes, and it seems to be taken over into this form in Romanos. Um, also, um, Aaron Walsh, um, who will also be speaking uh, much like um, Manolis Papoutsakis within this um, lecture series, um, her work, I think, is also very convincing in this way to see these connections between Jacob and Romanos. So I think now it's being investigated by a number of scholars. Any other questions? Hello, uh, Bill. I was just, um, your organization just to see you extending this um, uh, connection between the, the, the letters and the homilies, and also to contextualize uh, Jacob with this broad and sort of sophisticated um, intellectual and literary culture. H how is your work changing the way that you read uh, Jacob uh, um, in terms of? Um, sort of connections in terms of what you, where you think you need to go to contextualize Jacob. Um, those sort of, uh, I'm interested in you kind of just reflecting a little bit on that question. Thanks so much, Christian. It's good to see you too. Um, I've also seen that um, Susan Harvey has posted that Scott Johnson's also written on Jacob. Um, putting that out there. Too. Um, thanks for your question, Christian. What I'm interested in now is letters. Um, so not necessarily the letter on um, interactions between Jacob's letters and homilies and, and to the Greek world, but beginning with some of his casual letters that, um, so for example, this letter that um, reflects on Christology when writing to this father, um, who is a civil official, um, but has lost his son recently. So what would it look like if we started with Jacob's Christology there um, and thinking about the practical issues that he's responding to and then went and looked at the expressions of his Christology um, in some of his more doctrinal. Um, so whether it be connections there. So I guess I didn't begin this way myself by starting with Jacob's letters. Um, I was drawn into his poetry and into his homily and the beauty of them came to his letters. But I think that by beginning with the letters, we might have a different perspective on his homilies and the... the types of issues he might be thinking of when he's um, often that are found in the letters and the homilies. Mm -hmm. 
I think also it's uh, the letters are a very good way to think about Jacob as a figure in his time, um, which is sometimes very difficult to get out to from the homilies themselves. Thank you, Christian. Any other questions? Our time is up anyway. Uh, Philip, thank you very much uh, for this one. Thank, you, Miranda. thank all of you for his Jeff. Uh, Jeff is clapping. I don't know if they saw that. <laughs> I'm clapping. Um, thank you. Thank thank you for all of you for showing uh, for coming and joining us today. Before we adjourn, I'd remind you that our next speaker will be Jeffrey Wicks. Uh, he will deliver his paper, Saints and Jacob's Memory, on Wednesday, March 17, 2021. And by way of announcement, he is sponsoring three talks on John of Apamea. In April, uh, the guest speaker is Rodrigue Constantine, a recent graduate from the Catholic University of America. For more information, please visit hiddenpearl.org. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you in March.